Good evening, welcome along, glad you could join us. It seems to me that we actually started this program about half an hour ago when these guys turned up and they've been chatting away non-stop uh, since. It's all been shop talk, but wonderful to, uh, to talk to both of them and we thought we'd let you in on the conversation at this point. Uh, a real hour, I suppose, for armchair football fans because these guys, for many years, have brought you enjoyment, the action and the drama in your armchairs, whether you're watching TV or watching TV and listening to commentary. From the legendary John Helm, uh, how long have you been a veteran? How long have you been described as a veteran? <laughs> yeah, 1959 on my first working day, August 17th, said the veteran uh, broadcaster and journalist John Helm. There I'm used go. to it now. I'd, I'd be disappointed if I was not introduced to that. It was the step up from veteran. Damien Johnson of TV fame, BBC <laughs> Television, also Premier League TV, operating for many years. We used to work together at once did, yeah. at Radio Hallam yeah. years ago. What's a step up from veteran, would you say? Where does it I, go from veteran? I, I hate to think, actually. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, John. I was going to say it. I don't mind it. It's, uh, but he, yes, he, he's a veteran and a legend. He is a legend and a non-retiring legend at that. At a time when, in this month of September, uh, we've had two famous uh, retirements. Of course, uh, just the other day, Henry Blofeld bowing out from BBC Test Match Special. In fact, it's his retirement bash at the BBC tonight. And before that, a colleague of yours, well, you both know him very well, John Watson. Um, and yet... You're still going, John. Yeah, You've seen well, them both well, off. Oh, yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted about that because I'm sad to see anybody go leaving the business. And I'm sure they'll still be pretty active. Motty's 72. I'm a bit past that, as you know. Uh, and I, I've sort of run in conjunction with Motty over the years because when I joined BBC in 1970, Motty yeah. was part of the BBC radio team down in London, where I went subsequently. And Blowers, I actually produced Test Match Special. Not a lot of people know that. No, I did 1981 82. When I was based in Manchester, I produced Test Match Special, the matches at Old Trafford and Headingley. Wonderful, wonderful memories of John Arlott, Brian Johnston, even Don Mosey, uh, <laughs> Chris Martin Jenkins. Oh, I say it with, with tongue in cheek a little bit. You yeah. know, I didn't particularly get on. With uh, one of those. With, with, with one, one of those. Oh, <laughs> the majority I was getting Come on, on Spill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the, uh, the one he didn't get on with was a. a, a it, it, he had a nickname. Yeah, the older man, uh, because I, I yeah. worked in the same office as him and he hated football. That's partly why I didn't get on with him, because he absolutely detested football and would not have it mentioned in the office. Yeah. In a region, based in, bear in mind, this is the BBC North which included not only Manchester United and City, Liverpool and Everton, but Leeds and Newcastle and Sunderland and Bolham and Barnsley and Doncaster. He would not hear a word about any of them. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Mosey is the <laughs> gentleman in question. <laughs> yeah. uh, the well, I don't mind people knowing that. No, well, Mo Motti. Uh, you've worked with Motti. By the way, uh, talking about regions of football, what a resurgence there is this season and not before time in Yorkshire football. And I get you two guys to discuss that. It's hardly a team in this region, apart from mine, unfortunately, that's not doing doing well at the moment. Motti, though, um, were you surprised? I mean, it, the wording is he's retired from the BBC. He said, I, I remember the quote, I've not retired from everything. Yeah, well, first of all, he, he is a legend, and we use that word kind of a bit too freely sometimes. Yeah. But it, I, mean, I still pinch myself that I actually worked with him because, I, you know, like you probably, Alan, you, yeah. you grew up watching him. He was yes. the voice of football in many ways, along with one or two others. Um, and uh, to, to think that you could call him a colleague is, is, is quite something, you know, and you re I'll reflect on that in my career's over and think, well, that was quite an achievement to, just to work with him. And how did um, you find him to work with as a colleague? Uh, very generous, you know, always yeah. ready with words of encouragement. When I first joined the BBC Sport Department in 1998, I think it was, um, you know, anyone who's new in the office, he, he comes over and makes a, a point of having a word, offering a few words of en encouragement and, uh, you know, finding out a little bit about you. Um, but it's his, it's his attention to detail, I think. He's absolutely meticulous. And there's not a player he doesn't know, hardly a stat he doesn't know. Um, and he's just, you know, that's why he's been one of the best. Obsessive attention to detail, almost. I mean, yeah, the, it's, I, think, I think to be a, a top commentator, you you have have to, I'm sure you'll testify to this, John, you have to, you have to just be a sponge and just yeah. soak it all up and have instant recall so How that you, you can... What's your experience, Joe? Well, absolutely. The word I like there, Damien, uh, an inspiration in the sense that you aspire to be as good as them. Yeah. If you were working with Motti, I worked with Des Lynham. I mentioned Chris Martin, Jenkins, Cliff Morgan I worked with, and I, they were gods to me, broadcasting yeah. gods. John Arlott I mentioned as well. Yeah. So you wanted to be as good as them, and that brought you along. 
And you're right, he encouraged you, did Motti. Yeah. He encouraged me, even though he was BBC and by then I was ITV. Yeah. And the match I remember in particular was in the 82 World Cup in Spain, where we both did the famous Italy-Brazil game, right. where that wonderful Brazilian side of Falcao and yeah. Zico and Socrates got knocked out by a Paolo Rossi hat-trick. Right. And yeah. we were both doing the match, and Motti makes a very nice reference to me in one of his books about the fact that I called it uh, the, the Rossi hat-trick better than he did. Now, I wouldn't have put it that way, uh, because, as you said, Damien, his attention to detail was absolutely fantastic. If I did, it's because I had a better seat and a better view. Yeah. But that was so nice and magnanimous of him to say a thing generous. like that. Very generous. And his last game abroad, I think you might vouch for this, was in the European Championships in Ukraine and Poland. Yes, it was. Yeah. He didn't want to travel abroad after that. And he was very nervous. Motti is a nervous man. Yeah, yes. And before kickoff, I knew the team news way before he did because I was working for FIFA. Yeah. And I made sure Motti got it first. I turned around and gave him the team. It was all, oh, thank you very much, thank you. He was so grateful yeah. because it helped to just calm him down. And so uh, even though it's an absolutely tiny thing, I'm pleased I did that. It's really Because good he, you, he deserved, he deserved that respect. Yeah, yeah. that camaraderie between commentators oh. who are rivals. Yeah. It's nice. To, and, and actually, by and large, you find that in press boxes, don't you? That people do get on. You know, that, that, that we are competing, but, but, but there is that. There is a spirit between people doing the same job. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, if a goal goes in and you don't know who's the scorer, so you'll turn around and someone will, will tell you. I mean, I got in a bit of a pickle at Barnsley once, and I've told you this story off air before, but um, uh, there was one seat left in the press box, and I got there, and um, I was sitting next to the Radio Sheffield uh, summariser, and the goal went in, and I called it, oh, it's Owen Archdeacon. And Owen Archdeacon was sitting next to me as the summariser for Radio Sheffield, so I felt, I felt a complete, uh, you know, fool. Uh, that is fantastic. If I had a problem with Vince Skinner, Normanton, or Johnny Cole, <laughs> that's right, I was going back a bit. Yeah. I mean, I heard a better one that from Peter Slater, an old colleague on Five Live, still a colleague of yours. Mm. And, um, he called a goal at Hillsborough, which Sheffield Wednesday have scored, and in the, they said, right, we're coming to you. And then just before that happened, Peter saw that it had been disallowed. So he was just about to tell the studio that the goal had been disallowed as they were coming to him. And as they came to him, Sheffield Wednesday scored <laughs> for real. So we didn't have the embarrassment of saying, no, it was yeah. disallowed. Yeah. So that was, that was one. You mentioned about this um, the kindness. And, and I, I, I had saw that as a recurring theme in tributes to blowers as well, that people were saying he took time and trouble to help yeah. others out. Yeah, Did lovely, you find that? lovely, lovely, eccentric, yeah. of course eccentric. Yeah. And blowers wouldn't mind me telling this story, that when Go I did those test match, there were certain things I had to do. John Arlott said to me, just get the temperature right. And I said, temperature? He said, we start with the white wine, then we have the red. <laughs> Oil brings the champers, I was talking Bailey about 12.30, yeah. and then yeah. we have anything that's going. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> with Christopher Martin Jenkins, I had to fix up a game of cricket for him on the Sunday, because in those days, test matches were Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Sunday a day off. Chris wanted to play cricket somewhere, yeah. and so I had to find yeah. him a game. Fred Truman, I hate to tell this, but I'm going to do, hated signing autographs. And all these books would come in, and I can do Fred Truman's autograph to this day. There are thousands of people going around thinking they've got Fred Truman's autograph, but it's actually my big deal. What a shameful admission. Truman. That should go on <laughs> Simon Mayo's tea time program, <laughs> yeah, yeah, prime yes. time program, yeah, yeah. on Radio 2 yeah. as a confession. Yeah. yeah. It really should. All oh, right, I don't mind. And blowers used to want me to fix up a companion for lunch or dinner. Because he loved talking and loved telling tales. Nothing untoward, he just loved companionship. And he was used to stay at the Swan, a pub out at Butler Hill, I think it was called. Yeah. And my job was to find him somebody to have dinner with. There was nothing right. wrong with that. That's great. Right. Yeah, he was a terrific eccentric. Yeah. I, never knew, I never knew him and never met him, but uh, I worked with a girl, uh, a woman who was a camera operator, and uh, she'd worked various different roles in the BBC. Donna Lionel, name checker. And um, she got an attachment with Test Match Special, 1980s, I think it was. And uh, everyone's Athers and Blowers, and that's the, that's the names that they go by. And she introduced herself to Blowers and said, I'm Donna Liley, I'm the new production coordinator. And I said, Donna Liley, Donna, we shall call you Donners. That's why I was saying to Alan bit. earlier, yeah. sadly, people like that, Brian Johnston and John Arlott, wouldn't get jobs today. Probably John Arlott not. used to hate wearing headphones, and he wouldn't be able to cue in any wickets that had happened earlier in the day. He just used to throw them to one side, and I used to just tap him on the shoulder when he was like, good morning, and look up to the Lord, and tap him on the shoulder when it was his turn to finish. And now it's Trevor Bailey. Yeah. That was it. And he, yeah. he, he wouldn't get a job now. No. And no. Brian, because he did it, as you say, he'd be Johnners. 
I was I was Howell Muzz or John Muzz as well, and you'd be yeah. Biggers. And, uh, yeah, I was like, what? I wouldn't get a job, would he? Yeah, no, yeah. no, I, I, I suppose he would. Well, I don't know. I think I'd employ both of them. I mean, they go oh, so entertainment over the they? years. I People would. still employ you. You go around the world working for FIFA <laughs> and others commentating on football. You've been to Russia and America, America quite recently. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to bring you back home for a bit, just to yeah, sec yeah, yeah. section now, because this area has been in the doldrums for a long time. It's almost like there's a geographical fault line down the middle of the country which dictates that anything's west of Sheffield is in the or York west of Yorkshire is in the Premier League and this side's all in the championship but we've got Huddersfield Town in the Premier League for starters what a wonderful feat that is fantastic story yeah. isn't it I mean I'm up there quite a lot covering it for Premier League yeah. TV and, and I remember the first day I went actually having not really watched them for, for several seasons and and every team that comes up there's a bit of momentum and, and the people are talking big about we're going to stay up but the, the, there was a real palpable sense that this, they were serious. Yeah. That they knew that they had faith in the manager, he'd recruited well, and so far it's kind of, it's kind of working all right for them, isn't it? it? Damien, do you agree with me that you go around far more than I do these days, but I have this feel-good factor about Yorkshire clubs this season. Absolutely. I was talking to Alan earlier about Leeds United. I mean, the, yeah. the top of the championship. It's not just that. This chairman's got his head screwed up. Mm. He knows what he wants. He's, he's got a, a rapport with the fans already. Yeah. You know, when he sold Chris Wood to Burnley, he gave them the money back or another shirt of another player. When it was Newport County, he realised it wouldn't be a big case so they let kids in for next to nothing. He's, and when you walk in, there's a different atmosphere about the place. I've been to Barnsley this year. I've been to Rotherham. Even though Rotherham lost the day I was there, They've had two fantastic home performances, scoring yeah, scoring goals. goals. Bradford Great City, the field of factor is, yeah. is really there. It's tangible. It is. It's, I mean, you, you, you think that next season, and you hope Huddersfield stay there, you'd expect at least one Yorkshire team to, to, to join them. Potentially, I've been to Leeds a couple of times this season and, and share your feeling. I don't know the owner, Mr. Mm -hmm. Razziani, but how refreshing after the years of Ken Bates and what happened in between GF Capital was it and yeah, and Chilino. Uh, and, and Chilino, yeah, that yeah, now yeah. they seem to have a, a really proper owner. I did a dinner for the club uh, last year involving a lot of the old players, and the new chairman came. That was something that neither of the previous two chairmen had ever done. They'd never attended a right. function organised by the club at the time. That says a lot, doesn't he it? was there. I think it's, 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 there's no secret. You've got to carry the fans with you, haven't you? Of I mean, no, no one has been successful without doing that. No. I mean, no. there, there are lessons for, for various clubs around the place that aren't, aren't doing that. He bought the ground back, which was the, the yeah. first thing he did. Hugely which symbolic, isn't it? Wonderful, yeah, yeah. symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the two yeah. Sheffield clubs Absolutely. played well. Both in the top seven yeah. already. And top six. Going, actually, top six. Oh, yeah, going six, really well. Yeah. Going really well. Yeah, absolutely. Sheffield United, rather like Huddersfield, you know, have said a higher level, so what? You know, we expect to compete. Um, and it's just remarkable what they're doing. Third in the table. Tony Curry, and I wrote a column in the Sheffield Telegraph this week about it, about three, four weeks ago. They only played two games. Sat there, and I said, where, where do you see them finishing this season? And he just said, flatly, runners up. Really? Yes. Well, and I, there was a long pause, and, yeah. and, and, and and I can understand why, because it's that momentum thing. Yeah. The organisation, yeah. good manager, everybody believes in it, surging belief. Yeah. Um, and they've got a goal scorer, you know, Billy Sharp. Every uh -huh. club that's got a goal has got to have a goal scorer. You can't yeah. just do it with a few chipping in every yeah. now and again. No. Uh, and other options up front as well. I mean, he's, he's got a few strikers. Yeah, as we say, yeah. Clayton Donaldson's come in. Yeah. You know, Brooks will compete for a frontline place as well. A very fast player, young player, uh, David Brooks, is going to be sensational, I think. Mm. Uh, but Chris Wilde's kind of nursing him along. Back, he's he? right in there, mm. but not quite getting a starting place yet. So Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday, OK, they had a little dodgy start to the season. They have on the previous two, but... Uh, Qualities there. A couple of results change everything, don't they? I think you look at the two squads, Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday, you probably assume that Wednesday have got a bit more quality in their pure, you know, footballing ability. They should um, have, based on what they've, they've spent the, on the, on the yeah, players. Yeah. And they've been in the Championship for longer and they're, they're steady at that level. But um, it's a lottery, isn't it? The Derby match, it, it could go either way. Yeah, your, your thoughts. It's safer for you or you, John, to predict. A draw. The, the predict. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do That's what I'm going to do. It's safer for you two guys than me, because I cover both of them. Mm -hmm. I have to be really, really careful uh, what I say, not a foot out of place. So it's, it's easier for you instinctively to, to look at it and think, well, you said a draw. Is that where well, you're sticking? The, the, seriously, yeah, because I've covered so many derby matches in Sheffield. I've seen both sides win, yeah. but the majority of matches were draws. Mm. Uh, what always impressed me was that the local lads put in that extra effort. 
I always think of your David Hurst, your Mel Sterlings for Sheffield Wednesday, yeah. your Dane Whitehouses for Sheffield United. The game meant absolutely everything to them. And then, and, and we were talking about Bob Booker. And yes. he, now he's not a local lad, is he? He's, no, he's a Londoner. Yes. But boy, did that match mean a lot to Bob? And he, yes. he settled in the city, and he, he, he's, a, he's a folklore hero, isn't he? Great guy, folklore yeah. hero. He's got a book out at uh, this this moment, and he's going to be here in a few weeks' time as well. I'm delighted to say. Have you got any instinctive gut feelings about this this derby? It's here at uh, Hillsborough, of course, a week on Sunday. Yes. Yeah, so that would give right. Wednesday an advantage, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but we, you were talking before about the need for cool heads uh, yeah. you know there's always lots of fire and brimstone at a derby match yeah. but you know that could spill over you could get a sending off and the game changes there's only so much fire and brimstone you can get away with now compared yes. to a few years ago as the well the way they referee the game is different which is another it? reason why I can't had a flash of quality yeah. of it uh, I'm going I'm going draw I, I will make the admission that as of a week ago if you'd have pinned me to the wall and said if it's not a draw who do you think might win it I'd have said Sheffield United because of the way they started, the gung-ho mentality. It means, it means a lot to fans of both clubs, but when you've come up from seven years in League One, mm. back up to this level, in a, in a sense, the fans are relishing it even more. Uh, but Wednesday have won those two games, and they're back on a high, so I've got to go, go, back, to the, uh, go back to the original <laughs> prediction. I will say that I think it's a shame what's being charged. I mean, there's been lots of comments about this. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that Sheffield United fans are being charged something like £42 to, to attend this game at Hillsborough. And while I think the owner and chairman of Wednesday are doing a, a fantastic amount right, you know, his investment, his heart's in it, great commitment, I cannot, I cannot get my head around that as a price to charge for a championship game for visiting fans. Probably easier what? for us to say than for you, Alan, because Perhaps, you're based yes. locally, but I would agree. Yeah. And I just think that sometimes the fans, <laughs> short change is not the right word, is it here? But, the, you know, they, they should take in the opinions of the fans. And it is a lot of money in this day and age. So yeah. if you're going to go along and take your wife and take your little boy, you're talking over £120. Yeah. And then it's a programme, and then there's a cup of coffee or bottle of tea. It's a, it's a massive day out, isn't it? And OK, it only happens once a season, that derby match at Hillsborough and once at Bramall Lane. Yeah. But I think there's a bit lower level that would have been acceptable. What do you think? I th thoroughly agree. I mean, I think the fans sometimes do take a, get the rough end of the stick, really. And I think this is very much an instance where, you know, do you use the word profiteering? I mean, everyone wants to go to the game. Mm. 42 quid. For, it's a championship game, remember? This isn't yeah. Premier League football. No. Seems over the top to yeah. me. And... There will be people hoping that Sheffield United follow suit and reciprocate later in the season, but maybe they can make a more powerful point by not doing so. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. And Damien, another point on that, Huddersfield Town, and only charging, what, a tenner or something like that? That's right. It's a very advantageous Premier League game against yeah. Tottenham Hotspur. I, yeah, I think yeah. they play Leicester that same weekend. Yeah. And talk, imagine going to Huddersfield versus Tottenham Hotspur for ten For ten quid. Yeah. Yeah. Plus there's a season ticket offer. I think the chairman's guaranteed to, to give everyone who's been with the club a certain time when they've been struggling a uh, £100 uh, a season yeah. ticket. Which is, a, which is a great offer, isn't it? There's a lot of talk about bad owners in football, but I think we're seeing examples round here, certainly at Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield United, of good owners, Huddersfield Town certainly as well, and Barnsley with that. I mean, oh, yeah. Patrick Crine, heart-rending message mm, yeah. in the, in the programme the other night, a guy that prefers to be low profile, never wants to take centre stage, save Barnsley Football Club. Yeah, and unfortunately he's dying of cancer, yeah. you know. Um, there was nobody who wasn't touched by that message. No, and what it was nice, I saw on television yesterday some Vox Pops and virtually everybody in Barnsley was saying, what a good guy. Patrick, yeah. Without Patrick Crine, we wouldn't have a Barnsley no. football club. And it is only right that we pay testament to people like that at a time like this, which is full of grief for him, which is very sad. And it's, it's resonated with other football fans, hasn't it? Because everyone's yeah, come yes. in and said, you know, yes. what an amazing guy. Uh -huh. and, um, you know, I mean, obviously he's taken a little bit of criticism over the past year of a sale of players, but honestly, how does a club like Barnsley survive and carry on at that level without selling players? Yeah. You know, it just has to happen. Guys, uh, you won't be surprised to know that 20 minutes has just flown <laughs> by. That, that's the first half. We've still got to talk about many other things, including live streaming, the prospects under the new Sky deal of championship matches being streamed live uh, next season. Peter Ferguson, a journalist you know, wants me to persuade you, my mission should I choose to accept it, is to get John Helm on Twitter before the end of the programme. Peter, I do not accept that mission, but do rejoin us in five minutes for part two, it's going to be great. See you then, see you. <laughs>